Welcome to lecture 1.2, Cayley graphs. Now a Cayley graph is in some sense a mapping of a group. It's a neat visualization tool which we will use in probably the majority of our lectures in group theory in this course. And perhaps surprisingly, it's actually absent from the majority of abstract algebra and group theory courses. Um, it's, it's an optional topic and it's, it's not necessary, but I think it really helps and it's forms the basis of this visual approach which we'll use in this class. Okay, so let's talk about uh, how to solve the Rubik's Cube and how to create a road map for it. Now there, there are many solution techniques for solving the Rubik's Cube. If you do a, a Google search you'll find several methods for solving the puzzle. Now these methods describe a sequence of moves to apply relative to some starting position. So in many situations, actually in most situations, there are um, shorter sequences of moves that will get you to the solution. Now in fact, it was shown in July 2010, this is about one month after I met Erno Rubik in Budapest, that every configuration is at most 20 moves away from the solved position. And now when they say 20 moves, um, this group of researchers, they are actually allowing 180 degree twists, which is different from what I said in the previous lecture. But still, it's, it tells you that every one of those 4.3 times 10 to the 19 configurations is very close to the solved state. And now no one who could solve the Rubik's Cube actually knows the shortest path. From, um, they just have a, a collection of moves that they use. For example, I can solve the Rubik's Cube in about two and a half minutes, but I only know, um, I only utilize about, I don't know, maybe seven six or seven different sequences of moves that rearrange blocks and I use those to solve it layer by layer. Now about a, d a decade ago in the early 2000s I actually met the uh, current world champion Rubik's Cube solver. He was a uh, 14 year old um, kid from the Bay Area, California and I asked to, um, I actually have, uh, I have several funny stories about him. One of them is um, I gave him a Rubik's Cube and mixed it up and asked him to solve it behind his back and he he looked at it for about two minutes and put it behind his back and solved it. I thought that was just absolutely incredible. Um, and I have another friend who actually tried that same trick with him but he he took it apart and made it unsolvable so it so it can't be solved and so he, he hands it to this guy and the guy looks at it and a minute later hands it back and says no it can't be done. <laughs> but anyways I asked him I said so how do you do it um, so quickly and he said well, if you saw the Rubik's Cube, how many moves do you use? And I said, oh, six or seven. And he says, well, I use about 200. So in his bag of tricks, in his repertoire, he uses 200 moves. Um, and so that allows him to solve it in about 15 seconds. I only use six or seven, so it takes me two and a half minutes. But even, um, uh, um, so in theory, a computer that um, could solve it optimally um, and actually 4.3 times 10 to the 19th uh, moves is a lot more than a computer can handle, but in theory someone who knew the shortest path could do it in only 20. Okay, so let's get back to task now. Uh, let's pretend for a moment that we are interested in writing a complete solutions manual for the Rubik's Cube. Now let me be a little more specific about what I mean. Okay, so we'd like our solutions manual to have the following properties. First of all, given any scrambled configuration of the cube, there is a unique page in the manual. Think of it like a book corresponding to that configuration. And there is a method for looking up any particular configuration. I don't really care how, but there's, there's a way to do it. So uh, finally, uh, along with each configuration, um, or uh, uh, on each page corresponding to each configuration, there is a list of available moves included. And with each case, the page number for the outcome of each move is included, along with information about whether that move takes us closer to or farther, or farther from the solution. So, um, so let's call this solutions manual the big book. So here's a sample page from the big book. Um, so again, each page corresponds to the configuration. So on this page, um, it has to show you what the front of the cube looks like what the back of the cube looks like, how many steps you are from the solution, so this is going to be between 0 and 20, and also for each 
of the six uh, faces, uh, front, front, back, left, right, top, bottom, uh, there are two possible moves, clockwise or counterclockwise. Um, and if you make that move, this tells you what page you have to go to and whether you are closer to being solved or farther from being solved. And notice for each one of these pairs, um, you have to be, um, you can't both be closer to being solved. So one of these will be closer and one of these will be farther. Okay, so we can think of the big book as a roadmap for the Rubik's Cube. Um, each page says, you are here, and if you follow this road, you'll end up over there. Does this sound familiar? You might be too young for this, but um, this is a choose-your-own-adventure book. I'm actually not sure if these are still around. Probably not. So here's a potential cover and alternative title for the big book. Okay, so unlike a vintage choose-your-own-adventure book, you will additionally know whether over there is where you want to go or not. So this is like a choose-your-own-adventure book, but it's better. Okay, so some pros of the big book. Well, first of all, we can solve any scrambled Rubik's Cube. I mean, this is a manual for it, and we can do it optimally. Uh, secondly, given any configuration, every possible sequence of moves for solving the cube is listed in the book, long sequences and short sequences. And thirdly, uh, the big book contains complete data on the moves in the Rubik's Cube universe, i.e. the group, and how they combined. Okay, so cons of the big book. Well, first of all, we just took out all the fun of the Rubik's Cube. Though more practically, if we ha secondly, if we had such a book, using it would be fairly cumbersome. Got a lot of pages, which brings us to the most uh, practical consideration is we can't actually make such a book. Rubik's Cube has more than 4.3 times 10 to the 19th configurations. The paper required to write the book would cover the earth many times over. Okay, so make it electronic. Well, even that's too much of a pipe dream. The book would require over a billion terabytes of data to store electronically, and no computer in existence can store that much data. And that's, and that's just like if, um, if each if it was pure text. And I think um, um, once you include pictures, it's going to be a lot worse than that. Okay, so despite the big book's apparent shortcomings, it made for a good thought experiment, and that was the point of it. So the most important thing to get out of this discussion is that the big book is a map of a group. So we should not abandon the map-making ideas introduced by this discussion just because the map is too large. We can use the same ideas to map out any group, and in fact, we shall frequently do exactly that. A lot of groups that we see will have size 4, 5, 6, 10, 12, things that are small, and we can actually create a map and draw it on a sheet of paper. So let's try something simpler. Okay, so consider a clear glass rectangle that you can pick up and move around and label it as follows. So put numbers in each of the corners. If you prefer, you can use colors instead of numbers. Uh, we'll use numbers, and we'll call the above configuration, this one up here, the solved state of our puzzle. Now the idea of the game is to scramble the puzzle and then find a way to return the rectangle to its solved state. So this is like a, a two-dimensional version of a game like the Rubik's Cube. Now, we are allowed two moves, a horizontal flip. That means we have a vertical axis, and we flip the thing this way. So the, so the one and the two swap places, and the three and the four swap places. And a vertical flip, which means that we flip it along a horizontal axis, so the one and the four swap, and the two and the three swap. Uh, loosely speaking, we only allow these moves because they preserve the footprint of the rectangle. Let me ask you, do you see any other moves that preserve this footprint? And you should. So there's a move that is just do nothing. So don't rotate it. That's a, that is an action. And also, we can rotate this by 180 degrees. Um, that's the move that preserves the footprint as well. So when I said we are allowed two moves. I wasn't saying only two moves. We're actually allowed four moves. Those are just the two generators. OK, so question. Do the moves of the rectangle puzzle form a group? 
Well, how can we check? For reference, here are the rules of the group. Rule one, there is a predefined list of actions that never change. Yes, we have four actions. We can do nothing. We can flip it horizontally, vertically, or rotate it. Rule two, every action is reversible. Absolutely. Every action is deterministic. Rule three, and any sequence of consecutive actions is also an action. So all of these check out. Okay, for our convenience, let's say that when we flip the rectangle, the numbers automatically become right side up, as they would if you rotated an iPhone. And that's actually why I wanted to suggest that you think of these with colors rather than numbers, because then you don't have to worry about you know, the numbers being upside down or like reflected like in a mirror. You just what's what's important are the four corners and where and, and what their orientation is. Okay, so it's not hard to see that using only sequences of horizontal and vertical flips, we can obtain only four configurations. So unlike the Rubik's Cube group, the roadmap of the rectangle puzzle is small enough that we can draw it. So here's how you can think of it. This is the solved position. If we flip horizontally, then we get to this configuration. And again, that's about a vertical axis. But if we flip vertically, we get down here to this configuration. And again, the numbers, like an iPhone would, they, they become right side up. And then if we, um, now if we start in the identity state and we rotate by 180 degrees, we get down to this state down here. And notice that this rotation from here to here can be achieved two different ways. You can first flip horizontally and then flip vertically, or flip vertically and then flip horizontally. Okay, so I said observations. What sort of things does this map tell us about the group? Well, so I guess to summarize what I said is there are four actions. Um, there are two generators, the, the horizontal flip, the blue arrows, and the vertical flip, which corresponds to the red arrows, and the order does not matter. Blue, red equals red, blue. Okay, so let's let G, capital G, denote the rectangle group. And remember that a group is a set of actions. So this is a set of four actions and we are denoting that set with a capital G. So again it has four actions. The identity action, we call that E. Um, a horizontal flip, we call, let's call that H. A vertical flip, V. And a 180 degree rotation, R. So formally we say that the group G is this set of four actions. So we need two actions to generate G. If we only take one of these actions, um, it's not going to work. So in our diagram, each generator is represented by a different type or color of arrow. So we will write, use this notation, G is, this means generated by H and V. So the map from the previous slide shows us how to get from any one configuration to any other. There is more than one way to follow the arrows. For example, that 180 degree rotation, remember that was H times V, but also V times H. Because going um, H, or go, HV was going this way and that way, and that was the same as going that way and that way. So for this particular group, as I said before, the order of the actions is irrelevant. So uh, we call such a group abelian. Um, sometimes people might say commutative. I think abelian is a little bit easier to say. Um, and it was named after the math, uh, famous mathematician uh, Abel, or Abel, I'm actually not sure how to pronounce that. Um, but note that the Rubik's Cube group is not abelian. Um, it may not be apparent unless you actually play with the Rubik's Cube, but if you pick two different faces and you twist each face by a quarter turn, then the order that you do that does matter. You will get to a different state configuration depending on the order that you twist things. Okay, so also in the rectangle group, not in the Rubik's Cube group, every action in G, we say, is its own inverse. That means it undoes itself. So if, if you take a, a rectangle and you flip and you apply the vertical flip action twice, you get back to the same configuration. Um, same thing if you flip it horizontally twice or you rotate it 180 twice, you get back to the same configuration you started with. 
So symbolically, we write that a group is, is a set of four elements, or act, I should say actions. It's generated by these two actions, H and V, and each action, if you do it twice, you get back to the identity action, E. So we write that as E squared equals H squared equals V squared equals R squared equals E. So again, the Rubik's Cube group does not have this property. Um, if you twist a face by, um, by 90 degrees, you have to do that four times to get back to the identity. And if you do a long sequence of complicated moves, you might have to do that, I don't know, dozens or maybe hundreds of times to get back to the identity. I'm not really sure. That's, that's the thing. That, but definitely a lot more than two. Okay, so algebraically, we write that, um, well, let me just uh, do the first one. We say V, this is V inverse. The, how to undo a vertical flip is just V. So everything is its own inverse. Okay, so um, the rectangle puzzle can also be generated differently. Instead of a vertical and horizontal flip, it can be generated by a horizontal flip and a 180 degree rotation. So we write that as the group is generated by H and R. Here's a picture. So I said, let's build a Cayley graph using this alternative set of generators. Here it is. So here, um, I am going to remove the red arrows that went up, uh, um, up and down both sides because I don't want to include that into my generating set. Now I can, but I just don't need to. With just these two actions, I could get from any state to any any other state. So do you see how this roadmap has the same structure as our first one? Of course we need to untangle it first. But perhaps surprisingly, this might not always be the case. In other words, there are well more complicated groups and um, for which different generating sets yield roadmaps that are structurally different. They look a lot different when you write them out on paper. However, the groups are the same. So the um, group is not defined by its Cayley graph or its roadmap. It's, um, so it's a hard question if you have two different roadmaps to say, does this describe the same group? And again, we will see examples of this shortly. Okay, so as we saw in the previous example, how we choose to lay out our map is irrelevant. What's important is that the connections between the various states are preserved. However, we will attempt to construct our maps in a way that's pleasing to the eye and symmetrical whenever possible. As you've probably guessed from the name of this lecture and the fact that I've slipped and used the term uh, a couple times already, uh, the official name of the of this group roadmap that we've just created is a Cayley diagram and it's named after the 19th century British mathematician Arthur Cayley. So in general a Cayley diagram consists of nodes that are connected to each other by arrows of different types. So typically these are colored, uh, they could be labeled or maybe you'd use like dashed versus dotted arrows. Um, but generally, an arrow of a particular color represents a specific generator. Now, each action of the group is represented by a unique node, like we saw in the rectangle puzzle. Sometimes we will label the nodes by the corresponding action, um, and we'll see this shortly. Um, equivalently, each action is represented by a typically non-unique path starting from the solved state. Okay, so more on arrows. An arrow corresponding to the generator G from node X to node Y means that node Y is what you get when you start at node X and you apply the action uh, of G. So if an action H is its own inverse, in other words, that is that H squared is the identity, so in other words, if you like a horizontal flip, if you do it twice you get back to the identity or the do nothing action, then we have a two-way arrow. So we have something that looks like this, like a horizontal or vertical flip. So for clarity, 
typically what we do is we drop all the tips on two-way arrows. So instead of writing something like this, we just we just draw it like this. Um, and so in the Cayley diagrams we see throughout the class, we're going to have a lot of two-way arrows. So whenever you see a, a line like this with, with no tips, that means it's a two-way arrow. When we want to focus on a group structure, we frequently omit the labels at the nodes. So the Cayley diagram of the rectangle puzzle can be drawn like, like this right here. Okay, so let's map out another group, and we will call this the two light switch group. So consider two light switches side by side that both start off in the off position. This is our solved state. Okay, so let's consider two light switches side by side that both start in the off position. So something like this. This is the solved state. So we label this with the identity action, or the do nothing action. So we are allowed two actions. We can flip the left light switch, this one here, or we can flip the right switch. So starting from our solved state, if you flip the left switch, that's going to be the blue arrow, blue path, then you get to this state. But if you flip the right switch, you get down here. You could also flip both switches, in which case you get down here. So there are four actions in this group. And notice how the Cayley diagrams for the rectangle puzzle, which literally was the set of these four actions, do nothing, flip vertically, flip horizontally, or rotate 180. And this uh, group, the two light switch groups, are essentially the same. Although these groups are superficially different, the Cayley diagrams help us see that they have the same structure. The fancy mathematical phrase for this is the groups are isomorphic. So you're going to see a lot more on that later, and we are going to formalize what that actually means. Any group with the same Cayley diagram as either the rectangle puzzle or the two light switch group is called the Klein 4 group and denoted V4, and that's for Vier Gruppe, uh, which is 4 group in German. It's named after the mathematician Felix Klein. It is important to point out that the number of different types or colors of arrows matters. For example, the Cayley diagram on the right, right here, does not represent V4. Now that may not be clear right away because I did say that the same group can have different Cayley diagrams that do not resemble each other. But uh, we will see shortly why these things for actually represent different groups. So a few questions. What group has a Cayley diagram like this diagram on the right? you think about that? Well, here's a hint. Remember the rectangle puzzle? Let's suppose we make that the square puzzle, but we don't allow ourselves to actually flip over the puzzle. So maybe it's like a, 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 a square pyramid, or like a square with, with labels 1, 2, 3, 4, but it's got a, like a pointy top, like a pyramid, so you can't actually flip it upside down. Think about how that might have a Cayley diagram represented by, by this. Okay, so secondly, uh, how would you actually give a proof? I mean by that a convincing argument that these two groups have truly different structures. Whereas can you actually find a property that one group has that the other group does not? And well, let's look at this blue arrow. So this blue arrow has the property, or um, represents an action that has the property that if you do it twice, you do not get back to where you started. There is no action in this group that has that property. So because of that, these two groups actually have to be different. And finally, let me ask you, can you find another group of size 4 that is different from both of these? I'm going to just leave that as an open-ended question. Something for you to think about. Okay, so let's play our rectangle puzzle game, but with an equilateral triangle. So the triangle puzzle has these six actions. Well, you can, of course, do nothing. You can rotate by 120. You can rotate by 240. Well, that, that's the same as rotating by 120 in the opposite direction. It's the same action. Um, or you can flip horizontally. That means about a vertical axis, in which case two and three swap places. Now, once you do that, the triangle is is upside down. 
so the orientation has flipped. And so once you flip, you can you can flip and do nothing, which is this. You can, or you can um, rotate and then flip, or you can rotate twice and then flip. I think it'll be easier if we actually see the Cayley diagram. Now, before we specify a Cayley diagram, we have to specify a generating set, and I claim that R and F are enough to generate these six actions. And one way to see that is is each of these words right here is written using only R's and F's. Okay, so this, this should help. Um, so this is the solved state of the puzzle, and if you rotate it 120 degrees, that's following the red arrow, you get down here. If you rotate it 240, that's the same as, as that's R squared, that's R, R, and you end up here. If, if you start here and you flip it horizontally, that's about this axis, then the two and the three swap places, so then you are up here, and we label that with, with the configuration, and I, I'm going to put an F there as well. You could also rotate and then flip horizontally. That corresponds to rotating and then flipping horizontally. So you get down here. Again, flipping horizontally means that you are flipping about the vertical axis. Now notice that this R and then F is the same thing as going first flipping horizontally and then rotating twice R squared. More on this later. Uh, finally, th the last state is, is rotating twice and then doing a horizontal flip. So you're doing R, R, and then F. Okay, so uh, something that I've hinted at is notice that multiple paths can lead to the same node. This gives us things that we call relations in our group. For example, uh, here are five relations. Let's check each one individually. This one says R cubed equals E. That means if you start here and you do R three times, R, 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 you get back to, to node E. It's the same thing as doing nothing. Uh, this one means R inverse is R squared. So in other words, if you do R backwards, if you, if you undo R, you go R backwards, that's the same thing as doing R squared or R twice, R, R. This says F inverse equals F, which means if you do F, if you undo an, uh, the F action, which um, that's the same thing as doing F. So in other words, uh, how do you undo a horizontal flip? You flip it horizontally. So um, going backwards on the blue arrow is the same thing as going forwards. Um, this one, RF equals FR squared, so RF is the same as doing FR squared. We already mentioned that. And finally, this one says R squared F equals FR. So R squared F equals FR. Now, for all of these, I started with this node. But if you notice this diagram, and it's going to hold for all diagrams, it doesn't matter where we start. That locally, each node look ex looks exactly the same. In other words, um, let's take this one, uh, RF equals FR squared. RF equals FR squared. That's going to hold no matter where we are. Like, what if we start here? So, so starting here, we go RF, I guess this here, that should be the same thing as F R squared, and absolutely it is. Okay, so more on this later, but for now, uh, this is the first group we've seen, well, I, was, I guess not the first group, but outside of the uh, Rubik's Cube group, that is non-abelian, because doing R and then F is not the same thing as doing F and then R. So that's, that's an important observation to make. Okay, so some properties of Cayley graphs. Um, first of all, observe that at every node of a Cayley graph, there is exactly one outgoing edge of each color. And that makes sense, because think about the Rubik's Cube. Given any configuration, if you pick an action, you can, of course, do that action. And there's only one way to do that action. It's only going to lead you to one unique configuration, not two. So one question I want to ask is, can an edge in a Cayley graph ever connect a node to itself? Can you ever have um, something like this? Can you ever have a, a, a node here and have an edge that looks like that? And the answer is, well, yes, I guess you could. Um, 
what action is going to do that. If you're at a node and you have an action that um, keeps you at that node, then that is the do nothing action or the identity action. So you can label that if you want with E and answer this question as yes, that is possible. So maybe that wasn't the best actual question to ask um, because you don't ever need to include the identity action in a generating set. It's never necessary. So just assume that you don't have that. So a better question is, suppose you have an edge corresponding to a generator that connects a node to itself, like what I drew before. Does that necessarily mean that this edge connects every node to itself? In other words, is it possible for there to be an action that's the identity action when applied to some actions or configurations but not to others? Visually, I'm asking if the following scenario can ever occur in a Cayley diagram. Can you ever have an arrow of some type, like a red type, do this on one node and this on another node? Is that possible? Perhaps surprisingly, the previous situation is impossible. Let's properly formulate and prove this. So here's our theorem. Suppose we have an action G that has the property that G applied to X does nothing. You get X back for some other action X. So G is like the do nothing action. Then G, we claim, is the identity action. And that means that G applied to anything else is that anything else. And also it doesn't matter what order you apply them in. I can do nothing and then H. That's the same thing as, as H and then doing nothing. So if this holds for some action, then it holds for all actions. In other words, if you have x and you apply g to it, then what you have to get is when you apply g to any other action or configuration, if you prefer, you have to get the same thing back as well. Let me fix that. Okay. Okay, so here's our proof. The identity action, or the do-nothing action, we will denote this by 1 in the spirit of multiplication. Because if you multiply any number by 1, you get back that number. Um, so you can get this action um, by taking any action H and doing that and then undoing it. Right? If you do something and you undo it, then you've done nothing. So we're going to denote that by 1. So if G times X equals X, that, that's our assumption up here, then we can take this equation and we can multiply by x inverse on the right. Both sides of this equation by x inverse, and here's what we get. We get, so this, this thing becomes that there, and the left hand side, g x x inverse equals g, but the right hand side is x x inverse equals 1. So we have just concluded that g is the identity action. So thus, g is the identity identity action, end of proof. So this was our first mathematical proof. It shows how we can deduce interesting properties about groups from the rules, even though they were not explicitly built into the rules.